Hi, welcome back to the second module of the second week, which as you know by now is all about branching algorithms. So this is a really short uh, introduction to how you analyze the sort of recurrences that were coming up in our previous discussion of branching algorithms. So we'll just talk about how do you handle these recurrences and how do you come up with the kind of bounds that we were claiming in uh, the previous uh, module. So when we were working with branching algorithms, we noticed that the work that is being done by a branching algorithm is best understood by looking at the search tree that is naturally associated with it. And we said that the uh, work done is essentially proportional to the size of the search tree. And by size, I simply mean the total number of nodes in the search tree. But the total number of nodes is basically proportional to the number of leaves. So we've been using the number of leaves in the search tree as a proxy for the total amount of work being done by the branching algorithm. Now the number of leaves or at least a worst case bound on the number of leaves in a search tree is usually most naturally expressed by a recurrence and that recurrence is something that comes out of just studying uh, the recursive calls that the algorithm is making and how your concept of measure is evolving across these recursive calls. So uh, we have seen specific examples of these recurrences uh, when we did the vertex cover branching algorithms, uh, both when we branched on uh, an edge and also when we branched on a vertex versus its neighborhood. So I'll not repeat those specific examples for you. And in fact, in the lectures that are coming up, you'll see more examples of uh, these recurrences uh, show up, which is why we are having this discussion right now. So you're prepared to deal with these recurrences as they come up. Our treatment of this is going to be fairly short and black box-ish in the sense that there's been um, uh, a lot of standard techniques for handling uh, recurrences and in particular the kind of recurrences that we will have to worry about are mostly linear recurrences with constant coefficients. So these recurrences are fairly well understood. And our plan is to take advantage of this understanding quite directly without actually opening up any of these black boxes. So first, let's talk about a little bit of terminology. So suppose you have a branching algorithm that generates P recursive subinstances. And in these P branches, the measure that you're working with, which we will just denote by K, uh, drops by quantities D1, D2 up to DP respectively right? In this case, uh, d1, d2, and so on up to dp is called the branching vector of this recursive process. So just as an example, here are the branching vectors from the algorithms that we saw in the previous lecture. Hopefully this looks familiar. So we discussed three branching algorithms for vertex cover. Well, there were essentially two, but when we branched on a vertex, we um, had two different approaches, one of which gave us a stronger uh, bound on the number of leaves in the search tree. So these branching vectors are in correspondence with the recurrences that you have already seen. And uh, if this looks mysterious or strange in some way, then uh, please do pause here and go back to uh, the algorithms that we have already discussed in the previous lecture and try to make sure that the connection and the definition of a branching vector uh, is clear before we move on. Okay, so uh, if we do have a branching vector d1 through dp, then uh, the recurrence for the number of leaves in the search tree for such a branching algorithm uh, will be quite naturally given by t of k equals t of k minus d1 plus t of k minus d2 and so on up to t of k minus dp. That's again just because of uh, the form of the recurrence. So the algorithm itself is generating instances uh, where uh, the measure has dropped by d1, d2 and so forth. And so if you draw the uh, corresponding search trees, you will see that you have a root and you have these p subtrees uh, that are adjacent to the root. And the number of leaves in each of these subtrees is given by the recursive expression 
t of k minus the appropriate drop depending on which subtree you're analyzing and of course for the overall tree the total number of leaves is just the sum of all the leaves in all of these uh, subtrees so again if you relate this back to the examples that we have discussed in particular when uh, we were branching on an edge we actually explicitly drew out um, uh, the, the search tree so it may be useful for you to go back and tally that picture with the slightly more general expression uh, that we see here. So uh, the overall running time is essentially given by T of K. As we have discussed before, this is uh, with the working assumption that you only need a polynomial amount of time to generate the sub-instances and you only need a polynomial amount of time to resolve the base cases. Then you can say that the overall time uh, that uh, your algorithm takes is essentially uh, governed by T of K with this polynomial overhead. Just keep in mind that if you have an algorithm that has a different behavior from what these assumptions stipulate, for example, maybe you have a more expensive way of handling base cases, or maybe you have a fancy pre-processing rule which is also expensive that needs to be run before you can generate your sub-problems in a valid way, then maybe your algorithm requires a more sophisticated analysis compared to this general approach. But I think for the most part we are good. This certainly covers the scenarios that we will be encountering in the lectures so I don't think you have to worry too much about uh, the assumptions that we are making uh, on this slide but just know that these assumptions are in place. So let's take a closer look at this equation here. This of course is the recursive expression for T of K, which is the quantity we are interested in bounding. And uh, the kind of statement that we want to be able to prove is that T of K is bounded by some lambda to the K, possibly with a constant multiplier. Notice that these were the kind of bounds that we were claiming in the previous lecture. And uh, notice also that we are interested in finding or discovering the smallest possible value of of lambda for which this inequality holds. So right now we have no idea about what this lambda is but let's just pretend that it is true that t of k is at most c times lambda to the k and uh, let's pretend that we are trying to prove this inequality by uh, let's say applying induction for instance uh, and uh, we want to apply induction on k so let's say we know that this inequality holds for all smaller values of k. So then to show that t of k is at most c times lambda k what we uh, can use is the fact that uh, t of k minus d1 t of k minus d2 and uh, so on up to t of k minus dp can be subject to the inductive hypothesis because notice that um, all of the di's are strictly uh, greater than zero so each of these quantities the k minus di is strictly smaller than k so we can say that t of k minus d1 for instance is at most c times lambda uh, to the k minus d1 and so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and make those substitutions and so we know that this expression that you're seeing here on the left of the inequality at the bottom of your screen we know that that's exactly t of k right that's just by uh, the definition above and uh, the application of the inductive hypothesis as I described it right now. So this expression is what we want um, as being at most c times lambda k. So I've implicitly cancelled out the c's here. There's uh, every uh, term in this expression could have the c multiplier, but you'll see that uh, they all cancel out. So uh, if you rewrite this inequality, you essentially get um, uh, this sort of uh, uh, equation or rather uh, this inequality uh, which you can view as being a polynomial in lambda and by the way uh, what is d here uh, so d is uh, the largest of uh, the di's so essentially we are cancelling off whatever we can and uh, this is what we will be left with so we have this uh, polynomial in lambda which we want um, uh, to be non-negative and we want to know what is the smallest value of lambda for which this inequality holds. So it turns out that the polynomial on the left hand side of this inequality has a unique positive root. Let's call it lambda naught. This turns out to be the 
the best possible choice for lambda in terms of a value that satisfies this inequality any value of lambda that is less than lambda not will not work because it violates the inequality and since lambda not satisfies the inequality you would anyway not be interested in any values of lambda that are greater than lambda not even if they work out so Essentially, lambda naught is what we will call the branching number for this branching vector. And uh, that is the number for which you can say that uh, T of k is bounded by lambda naught to the k. So at this point, a natural question you might have is how do you get to this lambda naught? Uh, and this is uh, really just a matter of calculation. Once you have your branching vector, it's completely straightforward to write down uh, this polynomial in lambda. And uh, if it's a polynomial that factors easily and you can visibly identify the root, then that's great. Uh, you may have done a similar exercise for, you know, say the Fibonacci recurrence or something like this. So it can be a bit of a manual process depending on uh, how nasty a polynomial you're working with. Uh, one general way of of doing this is to go to a website like Wolfram Alpha, actually input the polynomial and uh, get the roots. Uh, a software uh, like that will use um, uh, basically again black box methods to come up with the root and it's not something that you have to worry about if you just want to uh, get to the number. Uh, the text on parameterized algorithms actually has this handy table. If you are only working with simple branching vectors that have uh, two entries in them or two coordinate branching vectors and uh, you know if they range from one to six then this table already gives you uh, the values and you can simply look it up. But you might have branching vectors which have more coordinates in them or maybe your drops are larger than six in which case you would actually have to resort um, to the use of software or just uh, maybe some uh, clever calculation depending on the polynomial at hand. So this was essentially an engineering perspective on how to come up with uh, the branching number for a given branching vector and uh, with this background in place we are now ready to tackle more branching algorithms. So in the upcoming lectures we'll be talking about uh, feedback vertex set and vertex cover in a new light with an exciting new parameterization. So I'll see you in those discussions. Uh, thanks once again for watching and uh, see you soon.